Hey guys, so I'm gonna answer a question I get asked quite a lot actually, because people know I'm a fan of a certain band and this is just something that I get asked and I thought I'd answer it publicly. So Mrs. Higgy is gonna help me with this by asking. So, Mrs. Higgy. What is your favorite Iron Maiden album and why? Thank you, Mrs. Higgy. So there you go, what's my favorite Iron Maiden album and why? Well, I'll answer with the riff. <laughs> Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Now, that was the first Iron Maiden album I ever discovered. And it was an old cassette tape, right? Remember those guys, right? Cassette tape, and it was, uh, yeah, so the, the album artwork was like really weird. So if, you're, if you guys are familiar with that, obviously you know that the cover is that icy looking uh, lake arctic thing with like Eddie. Musically though, uh, sound-wise, it's, it, it, it's really unusual because it, you've got this kind of almost cold, hollowy kind of sound to it, but I really, really enjoy that. And I think that for me personally, as a fan, I think it's got one of Bruce's best vocal performances of all time. Now, of course, there are albums where he sings higher and more elasticated and more operatically Virtu virtuoso e I can't even think of the words e um, but for me personally I love Seventh Son because he sounds huge on this album like his delivery is his power and his gruffness to me it makes him sound like a giant not like a man but like a giant he sounds like a great big monster singing sometimes just because of the way he has so much intensity uh, and delivery in his vocals, the enunciation of the words, it's, it's just great. Um, and the guitars, it's funny because as an album, the guitars are not as far forward as some of the albums. It's mainly due to the reverb. So if you listen to something like Power Slave, where the guitars are a bit more, well, obviously there's verb on that album too, but not quite as much. It sounds a lot drier, that album, and I love that for different reasons, you know. But Seventh Son, it's almost like they've recorded it in a castle courtyard, you know, it sounds like it's recorded surrounded by old weathered stone, you know, that kind of hollow reverb where the guitars are kind of not like, they're not in your face like Metallica Chug. Not that Iron Maiden have ever sounded like that anyway, but it's not even Power Slave Chug, it's not. It's not even that, it's got this kind of really nice hollow, crunch to it, which is it's hard to describe, but if, if you're a fan of the album, you know what I mean. And then the solos, obviously, they're not like, for the era, they're not like flash, outrageous 80s solos, you know, they've done flasher solos than that. You know, you know especially Adrian, you know, on, this, on the uh, Summer and Time album, that's kind of where Adrian kind of really came into his own and ramped up, you know, to his sort of like pinnacle as a guitar player, or towards his pinnacle, you know, he's continued to do amazing stuff and continued to improve. Uh, but it's really more about the guitar rather than just being a flash lead guitar instrument it's, it's more about it's just part of the overall composition. It's just another layer. It's another texture uh, Yeah, for me, I mean I could waffle on for, about Iron Maiden for just ages, you know Everything about it is just firing on all cylinders and a lot of people didn't like it I think at the time because of the synth elements to it but I think by the time that they'd gone through the Summer and Time album and got onto Seventh Sun the synth elements were integrated a bit more. They weren't quite as in your, it wasn't quite Blade Runner, it was a bit more like just some of the synth patches they were using, I think, I think blended a bit better, you know. Things like the clairvoyant, like the, the, the sections between the verse and the, the chorus, you know, da, 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 just the little swells of synth in there. It's a lot, you know, it's a lot more tasteful than a lot of the time when synth get used. Now, nowadays with synth, it's just like synth uh, string patch, you know, all over everything. For Seven Sun, is a little bit more inventive and a bit more interesting. So why Iron Maiden? Why not an, any other metal band? Why, what was it about Iron Maiden that kind of drew you to them? Well, because it took me to a different place, you know. It wasn't just a rock band. For me, this was like an imagination album, you know. You know, I, I spent a lot of time drawing as a kid, you know, playing guitar as well, but when I wasn't doing that, I would just be listening to music. And, you know, the other stuff I was listening to at the time, like a lot of my friends at the time, we were all listening to like the first Guns N' Roses album, um, because that, like, when you discover that as a kid, you know, it's like, wow, they're swearing on this, it's really cool. 
Um, but it was a great album, you know, we used to sing the solos to Appetite for Destruction, that's how, you know, melodic they were. Uh, but then I got into Iron Maiden, you know, with the Seven Sun album, and to me that was like night and day. Whereas like the, the Guns N' Roses stuff in, in like Van Halen was kind of like rock, hard rock, not down to earth, but it's like obviously it's guitars, drums, rock. You know, you can imagine it's like real world stuff. But with Maiden, it's not real world stuff, it's fantasy stuff. It takes you to a different place entirely. And I don't know what it was about that. It just, just captured my imagination. And uh, yeah, that's, that's all I can say about that. It just took me to somewhere else entirely that wasn't the usual rock band subject matter, like relationships and cars and girls and partying. You know, this, this Maiden, all this stuff was about things that you don't hear about. So when was the first time you actually got to see uh, Iron Maiden live? 98. It was the Virtual Eleven World Tour with Blaze on vocals. And um, it was at Newport... Did, was it Newport Centre? In Wales, basically. Uh, I think it was the Newport Centre, I want to say. Not Newport. Yeah, it's not Newport Arena. It's, it's not an arena. It's Newport Centre. Um, obviously when Bruce got back in the band they were playing Cardiff Arena instead but at the time they were playing Newport Centre but I'm grateful for that because the first time I got to see them the venue wasn't that big, it was big enough, it was like just think like big ass auditorium and the band sounded phenomenal and it was loud as hell and um, And how old were you? 13, I, was, I wasn't even 14 at the time and I actually got to meet them as well Cool. Uh, which was epic. I didn't even realise Steve Harris was stood right next to me until I turned around and was like, Steve says, okay, like that. And I got him to sign my uh, programme and he signed it and I was like, oh, cheers, Steve. I was like, you know, as a kid, you know, you're really excited. Cheers, Steve. He's like, that's all right, mate. Right. <laughs> this typical uh, East End accent. It was brilliant, you know. Yeah, it was epic. But the band were on fire. They, I don't know what it was about that period and I don't know whether it's because, you know, a lot of people you know, picked on the fact that, you know, obviously Blaze was having to fill Bruce's shoes. And, you know, so some nights, you know, he might have struggled a bit more than others. And I think the band felt that and I felt that they had more to prove. And as a consequence, when you watch performances of the band from that era, they are all bringing their A game so much. Like Dave and Yannick are like, that's the most intense I've ever seen them play. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's all I can say. I mean, from that period, if you go and watch... Maiden from like, I don't know, 96, 98, the band themselves, they are, it's like they've got this renewed sense that they need to prove themselves. There's a bit of fury and aggression in there, which that now they don't have so much because, you know, they're just riding the wave of being Iron Maiden, like the greatest metal band ever. Um, but back then, any fan that's interested, I really do recommend you, even, even if you're not a fan of the Blaze era, go back and watch the band. They are absolutely on fire. I've, you know, so good. They really brought their A game, and I think they had to. They had to compensate. Yeah. Okay, so when was the first time you got to see them with Bruce? Uh, 2000. It was um, Earl's Court, London. It was actually an event called Metal 2000. I, everything around the millennium was something 2000, because <laughs> it's funny when you look back, everything had 2000 in the title or something. But um, the, the support bands were Entombed, who I'd never seen, uh, and Slayer, also who I'd never seen, or even heard at that point. Wasn't familiar with either of those bands. Uh, didn't really get to see Entombed, so mainly heard them. And then we walked in for Slayer, I really enjoyed that. Um, and then, yeah, Maiden, I just went crazy for Maiden. I went so crazy for the first few songs, I actually got dehydrated and had to go out of the, out of the auditorium and, and, and get some sugary drinks. I think I had to wait around until they managed to replace some Coke or something like that. That's Coca-Cola kids, all right? And uh, yeah, I had to drink that and, and then go back in and then sort of hang around at the back because I was just, I was screwed. I'd really wiped myself out, you know. I didn't really have a concept back then of like hot venue, loads of bodies close together, you going crazy and just losing so much water and feeling so faint. So yeah, that's what happened to me there. But it was great. I loved it. I remember feeling so pumped. Uh, watching them, <clears throat> but you know, I, I knew all the song, all the new songs, all the lyrics, to all the stuff like you know, off of Brave New World. So when they did stuff like Blood Brothers and Brave New World, it, it was great, you know. And I've always been one of those fans who likes to hear the new material, 
uh, live. You know, I don't really care whether they play I May Not Hallowed Be Thy Name again because they played it so many times. You know, I want to hear some exciting stuff like, you know, when the hell are they ever going to do Alexander the Great live? You know, we all want to hear that. When you think about the guitar players in Iron Maiden, what is it that sort of makes them stand out immediately from each other? Uh, Dave Murray, Woodley Legato, Adrian Smith, more constructed solos uh, with a heavier vibrato, uh, Yannick, uh, chaotic, uh, lots of flurries of fast picking. Um, that was my first initial impressions, you know, and, and then the more I got into hearing all of their other albums and then getting better as a guitar player myself and being able to appreciate more techniques and stuff like that, um, you go back and you have a new appreciation uh, for their sound. Like, uh, growing up, I would say that Adrian was my favourite Maiden guitarist for such a long time, and I guess in some ways he still is. Um, but the more and more I got into guitar, the more I appreciated Dave's playing style as well, just for the fluid legato. And I really like Dave's tone. Dave's tone, I think Dave, the best tone that Dave has ever had, lead guitar-wise, has got to be the Fear of the Dark era. Even though the album itself is probably my least favourite Maiden album, for, and everyone thinks it's No Prayer for the Dying, you're wrong, it's not. I think Fear of the Dark uh, is not as good as No Prayer because Fear of the Dark is a lot patchier in terms of the songs. Uh, no Prayer has actually got better songs, it just doesn't sound as good. People mean, think that that means the album's not as good. No, if you get over the sound of No Prayer, um, I actually think the songs on that are better. Anyway, I've digressed, haven't I? I was um, talking about the guitar players. But um, yeah, uh, Dave's lead guitar tone around the uh, Fear of the Dark era was so good, so fluid, so creamy. I, I don't know, I think they were using Marshall JMP rack units at that time, I'm not quite sure. But yeah, the tones he was getting around that period are beautiful. Absolutely love them. Uh, and then Yannick, I've got more of an appreciation for Yannick as well as I've had to be learning his stuff for the Iron Maiden course I did. And um, what a lot of people don't realise about Yannick is um, his picking. He's actually more of a picker than people realise and he actually really does lean into economy quite a lot. His stuff is, is not easy. You know, whilst he does play a lot of the licks that are reoccurring in a lot of his solos and uh, his bending, he just goes for it. He doesn't really care so much about vibrato and even pitch sometimes when he bends and he'll admit that himself he really is just a, a go for it guy like a, like a fuck it and just go for it kind of player and he said that himself so I don't think I'm being derogatory at all to Yannick because you know, I love Yannick he's a great guy um yeah he's not refined he's he's like unrefined but when he's on fire he's on fire they've all got brilliant elements to it and like I said Adrian was my favorite guitar player because, you know, the quality of his constructions, his solos, are just amazing. And, uh, you know, he's continued to push himself as well as the years have gone on. You know, he's been inspired by other guitar players. And he's continued to, like, you know, push the envelope of what he's capable of. So, yeah, they're all great. They all stand out. They've all got their own recognisable style to each, uh, to, to an Iron Maiden fan. Is there anything about Iron Maiden you would change? Produce the albums better. <laughs> That's about it, really. Um, I think any fan can always have an idea of what someone could do better or should do better. Um, but I think it, it comes down to the fact that, well, at the end of the day, they're Iron Maiden and you're not. You know, there's a reason why they're Iron Maiden and you're a fan uh, because it's their decision to make. You know, and, and some of their decisions we might not like, some of them we will like, but you know. Going on the journey is, 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 is part of the thing. So, but yeah, just, just from an audio perspective, I honestly think that, um, you know, that stuff could be produced better, but um, I wouldn't want to be in Kevin Shirley's shoes because how do you tell Steve Harris what to do? <laughs> you know, so I think there's a bit of um, unfair criticism of Kevin because uh, he's got a difficult job. You know, those guys like to do things. They're British. And as we know, as, well, speaking as a British person, I can tell you that, you know, we are quite traditional. When we find a way that works, we tend to stick to it. You know, it's very hard to get a British guy to change. And you've got a whole band of British guys from, you know, the, who were born in the 50s. So you try telling those guys what to do. Ain't going to happen. So you, you could get the... Well, it doesn't matter what producer you get working with made, and they're going to do it their way, and you can go fuck yourself, according to the producer. So, you know, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I would like to get get them, you know, sounding a bit, you know, a bit more 
Uh, well, we all know it could sound better than it does, but I must admit, I really like the uh, last album, Senjutsu. I think, you know, that's... It's really brought in some stuff that, you know, well, just pleases long-time and new Maiden fans, really. I think that's something, something about that album. Again, I've digressed, but then this is what happens when I talk about Maiden. I could talk about them for hours and, and digress through every little avenue about Maiden. Um, what I really liked about the last album was, for me, as a fan, emotionally, I feel more connected to this than anything else they've done since Brave New World. Um, I don't know why that is. I, I just do. I just feel like there's more of an emotional presence in this. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it's, I don't know if it's because as fans we all wonder whether this might be the last one um, or do not. You, do you think it's because they're more mature? Possibly. I mean, I think, you know, as, as they get older, they probably get on with each other more and they forgive each other more and their egos have tamed a little bit. So I think they're able to give themselves more to the music without anything petty getting in the way. And I think, yeah, their own life experiences and the fact that they're getting older, coming to the music probably is there's more emotion to it about things which people can relate to from an everyday perspective. I don't even know if that sentence made sense. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we all love Maiden when they're singing like Where Eagles Dare and all the, like, the adventure stuff and all the fantasy stuff. But as they've gotten older, obviously there's a lot of stuff which resonates with everyday people about life in general. And I think that's creeping into Maiden's music, you know. So there's probably, that's why there's more of an emotional connection, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe it's just the fact that we love hearing them still doing what they're doing. And I think it's like watching a Rocky movie, I think. It's like when you see Rocky achieving something great against the odds. Like you're so with him and you so want him to win and it feels like you've been on the journey with him together. So when you see a band that's like your favourite band still coming out and then kicking ass all these years later, sort of against all the odds in a way, it's, it feels like a victory and that's why it feels quite emotive, I think, as well. Do you think this should be their last album or do you think they should keep going? Oh, I don't know. I mean, if it was their last album, I think it would be an absolutely fine album. To, to end the career on. I mean, what a brilliant way to bow out. Uh, Hell on Earth, the last track on that album, is, would be like the perfect swan song. And I think maybe that's why lots of people love Hell on Earth and find that track so emotional as well, because it, it almost feels like the most triumphant exit, the most triumphant farewell possible. Um, but if they did as well, I wouldn't blame them, because, you know, it's, it, if it's who you are, you continue to do it. You know, who's to tell you, you know, you shouldn't do it anymore. But yeah, as a fan, of course, I'd love to have another one, but I'm also happy if they don't. Well, no, I wouldn't be happy. I'd be incredibly sad. I'm gonna, I know I'm going to be incredibly sad when they hang it up. Um, and I'd love to see another one. Of course I would. But I'd always rather have quality rather than quantity. And in fact, actually, just to go back to one of your earlier questions about is there anything I would change, as a fan, um, I must admit, I would actually be happier for bands to have fewer songs on an album and just make them all killer rather than do double albums, but it's okay. I, I, I don't complain either. I, I understand why they do it, because if these bands get older, the time between albums increases. So when they get together, they write a shit ton of music, you know, like Metallica and Maiden, of course. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I'd rather have eight or nine epic songs and then just that be that. Final thoughts on Iron Maiden. They're a band that have stuck to their guns. They've got a recognisable sound. Uh, they have been at the top of the world. They've done the most gruelling tours and they've changed the lives of so many people. Uh, they've been the soundtrack to so many people's lives. Mine as well. And yeah, and, and they're, they're not everybody's cup of tea. Of course they're not. But what I love about Maiden is they really do not care that they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that they never won a Grammy. Like I said, they're British. They're, they come from a stiff upper lip generation of Brits who just got on and did the job. You know, and you just don't whine, you don't complain, you don't give a shit. You're not there to be patted on the back or get awards. You're there just to do the job and be epic doing it. And that's why people love them so much. And that's why they're still going when so many other bands have imploded or retired because, you know, they can't hack it or whatever, you know, Maiden is still there doing it because they're old school, you know, they are, what can I say, you know, they're, they're, they're the best British export there is.
So yeah, if you've never heard the Seventh Son of a Seventh Son album, really go and give it a listen. Moonchild has to be one of the best album openers of all time. And yeah, just give it a bash. You know, from that album on, my next favourite was the next album I discovered, which was Peace of Mind, which is another great sounding album. But yeah, I really recommend just get into the Maiden stuff, for sure. You know, Seventh Son, Peace of Mind, Power Slave, Number of the Beast, Somewhere in Time. But check it all out, because there's going to be something that you'll love of every era. It's all worth it. And, and check out Senjutsu as well, the latest one, definitely, for sure. But yeah, Maiden is such an important band to me. As I said, I could talk about them for hours. And hopefully you guys can get an insight into why I love them as a band and the impact they've had on me as a guitar player and why they were kind of the band. Because everybody has a band which is like their band. You know, for a lot of Americans growing up, it was Kiss or Aerosmith or Van Halen. Um, and for a lot of us, it was Iron Maiden. For me, Iron Maiden was the band. So go and check out Maiden now. Mm -hmm.